Hello and welcome to Guest Chef Night at Home, Perfecting Pizza. If you're looking to up your game on pizza making, you're at the right place. I'm Chef Wayne Johnson, joining you from the Modern's Cuisine Kitchen here in Bellevue, Washington. Before we get started and to help center equity in our work and conversation, I want to begin by acknowledging that we are located on ancestral lands of the Coast Salish people and specifically stand on the lands of the first people of Seattle and Duwamish. With honor, with gratitude, the land itself and the Duwamish people who have stewarded past and present. For nearly 30 years, Fair Start has been transforming lives, disrupting poverty and nourishing communities through food, life skills, and job training. Last March, about a year ago, when COVID hit, we transformed our kitchens and redeployed our staff to make our community, make sure our community did not go hungry. To date, we have produced over 3 million meals. 3 million meals. While doing that, we are supporting our students and grads through virtual job training, case management, wraparound services, to help provide pathways for economic stability. Our work may look a little different right now, but we know how important our programs are for sustaining and transforming lives. Our students and grads could not be here with us in the kitchen tonight, but many of them will be joining us virtually. We are so excited to be with you for this virtual version of Guest Chef Night that supports our local chefs and restaurants creates community, and yes, we're going to have fun. We're going to have a ton of fun tonight making pizza. I want you to know this event is completely free, but we welcome your donations. If you want to support, visit bearstart.org and support the mission. All COVID safety protocols will be in place. You'll see me most of the evening masked. I'm socially distanced from our guest chef. Our guest chef is socially distanced from the camera crew, who is also masked. As a matter of fact, everybody within the facility will be masked. We take our health and our safety seriously, and I hope you do too. Tonight is my privilege to be in the kitchen with Chef Francisco of the renowned Modernist Cuisine, which is always on the front lines of food innovation. We provided on our website a shopping list for those folks who want to practice alongside of us. If you have questions tonight, please put them in the chat and our team will try to answer as many as we can. Now, let's make pizza. Hello, Chef Francisco. Thank you for having us in your beautiful kitchen. Tell us a little bit about yourself, modernist cuisine, and making this perfect pizza. Sounds good. Chef, uh, first of all, thank you for being in our kitchen today. It's a great honor to have Chef Wayne and everybody from Fair Start here. And uh, it's my honor to be able to share what we do here with you and uh, to show you a little bit about pizza. Um, so we spent about four years writing this book on pizza. It's been a labor of love. Uh, our book is going to be out on October 5th. It's out on sale October 5th. And I'm going to show you just one of the 1,600 recipes that we have in our book. Uh, and I want to show you one of my favorite styles of pizza, which is thin crust. It goes by different names in different parts of the world. Uh, there's Chicago thin crust, Sao Paulo in Brazil, they have a very thin crust pizza as well. It's all unified by the same theme, theme which is, as you guessed it, a very thin crust of pizza dough. It's a, I picked this particular pizza dough not just because I really like it, because there's many pizza styles that I enjoy, but it's because it's pretty easy, and if you follow these steps that I'm going to show you, you can make great pizza. It is uh, uncomplicated in the realm of things that can get really complicated. Say, if we were doing a Neapolitan-style pizza, that requires a lot more time. It would require a very special oven to bake it, and we uh, simply want to make things simple today. So I'm going to show you how to make our just our basic version of thin crust pizza. And I'm also going to show you if you want to learn how to make ricotta, which is also super easy, I'm going to give you a quick demo on how to do that. It requires just one like somewhat a special ingredient, which I'll talk about in a bit. Uh, but 
there's a particular delight to be able to make your own dough, to make your own pizza, to make your own cheese. Uh, of course, you can order it. It's super fast to order pizza, but making your own has its, its particular rewards. So hopefully uh, I can get you, uh, you know, pumped up enough to make your own pizza at home. So we're going to get started with the dough. I have all my ingredients laid out here. Uh, and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to mix water with the yeast. So this is just regular water. There's a lot of myth about, you know, is this water better than that water? Is water from the Vesuvius better than water from New York City? Uh, and we did a lot of research on that. And the answer is that the water, as long as you drink it, as long as it doesn't smell funny, it doesn't taste funny, and it's not like slimy, if it's water that you would drink and give to your family, it's water that makes perfectly fine pizza. Okay, so this is just room temperature tap water. So, Chef, you suggest just room temperature on that, yes. on that water. Yeah, and it really depends on what your room temperature is. If you're like, if it's like New York City in the summer, your room temperature is probably a little <laughs> high. Yeah. So, when we say room temperature, we mean 70 degrees Fahrenheit. So, if your water, tap water comes out at that temperature, that's pretty good. If it's too warm, your dough is going to ferment very quickly because yeast likes that warmth. Yeah. So, we yeah. want to keep it at about 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Nice. Okay? Thank you. Yep. Okay, so then we're going to add the yeast. So the yeast is, this is called instant dry yeast. It's different from what you can find uh, in most grocery stores, which is active dry yeast. It works more or less the same, just active dry yeast is going to take a little bit longer to ferment. It's just, it's a different process. I'm not going to get into what goes into making these two different yeasts, but if you can only find active yeast, you'll just have to wait a little bit longer than if you use instant dry yeast, okay? So I'm just going to sprinkle it on top of the water. Normally, if I'm just making this pizza, I've made so much pizza dough in the past that I would just go ahead and keep going. But if this is your first time, you want to make sure that that yeast is fully hydrated, meaning that it's absorbed the water it's in. So you're just going to basically take a little whisk like this one, and you're going to stir it. And you're just going to stir it until you can see that the yeast has dissolved into the water, okay? With active yeast, you need to use warmer water, and that's why I hesitate to use active dry yeast, because if you use warmer water, then your fermentation is going to get a little too fast and might get out of hand. So just use instant yeast if you can find it. It's pretty easy to find. Once we have the yeast dissolved, then we're going to add our flour. And we use two different kinds of flour. We're going to use cornmeal, which is uh, coarse, and this is basically going to give us a, a really nice texture in our dough. Okay, It's going to give us a little bit of crunch. Um, so we're going to add that in, and it is characteristic of this particular type of dough to, to use cornmeal. And then we're going to use flour. Now, I wouldn't use just any flour. What I would use is a strong flour. So when you buy the flour, make sure it says bread flour. The stronger it is, the better, okay? So now we're going to start mixing. You could mix this by hand, uh, but if you have a mixer, just let the machine do the work. It's, I, I feel strongly about letting machines do most of the heavy lifting, okay? So... We're going to put this on our mixer. When we mix anything, whether it's pizza dough or cookies or whatever you're mixing, always start on the slowest speed, okay? If you start too high, you're going to be wearing the ingredients and you don't want that, okay? So we start slow. Hey, Chef. Yes. When you say stronger dough, are you talking gluten at that point? Yeah, so bread flour is a stronger flour. It's, okay. it's a flour that's meant to expand and withstand the structure of this, like, high temperature baking, and all of the steam that's happening inside the dough so you can get a nice, crusty, chewy dough. Yep. Uh, same goes for pizza. It's, it's going to give us a nice, crispy, crunchy pizza. Uh, weaker flours are good for, like, cookies, yeah. or if you want to make pie dough, something that needs to be more tender, okay? Got it. But with pizza and bread, we need a stronger flour. And it does translate into gluten. The higher the gluten, the stronger the flour. Okay, so once we have uh, you know, the ingredients starting to mix a little bit, we're going to, we can step up the speed. These machines, mixers in general, the, the stand mixers that you have at home, you have to keep an eye on them uh, because they tend to be top heavy and bottom light. So what this means is that as your dough starts to get stronger, the machine's gonna start <laughs> dancing around your table. Uh, I've seen once or twice a machine fall to the floor and it's one of the saddest things because you're gonna have to repair that mixer. It's, there's no way it survives that. Anyway. So what we have here is what we would call a shaggy mass, okay? So a shaggy mass means what? A shaggy mass means that I, don't, I can't identify an ingredient that has not been incorporated into the dough. I can't see flour, I can't see yeast, I can't see anything but a uniform shaggy mass of dough. 
At this point, the dough has no structure. I wouldn't like say that that's ready by any means. I would say that we need to start forming, as we mix, we start developing the gluten. Know that a dough, a flour, doesn't contain gluten. In a sense, gluten happens. And what I mean is, as the water hydrates or wets the flour, what is happening is that the proteins in the flour are gonna to start to bind to each other, and they're gonna start forming gluten chains, okay? So your flour technically is gluten-free, uh, <laughs> but once you start to mix it, then the gluten starts to form. Uh, and as we have a stronger door, dough, we have gluten strands, think of them like little rubber bands that get stronger and stronger and stronger the more we mix the dough. So what I'm looking for here is the dough to uh, have some sort of body, some sort of texture before I add the salt. Some of you may have thought, he forgot the salt. The truth is that we withhold the salt so that we can let the dough develop slightly before we add it. Why is this? Because salt tends to inhibit gluten development. It gets in the way of that protein chain formation that forms gluten. So if we withhold it, what we're gonna do is we're gonna help the dough develop faster than if we added the salt at the beginning. So we're gonna take a look at this. Uh, I'm gonna turn the speed up a little bit more. Oh yeah, you're and, about ready to have a dance and mix it up. Yeah, I mean, that's, and because this dough is what I would consider a dry dough, meaning it doesn't have a ton of water, it will have more of an impact on the mixer. It'll really like push the mixer around. So that's why we really need to make sure that we don't go and get something in the fridge or just keep a hand on it, you know, away from the hook, obviously, but try to keep it steady so that it doesn't dance around your table. And, and only dough hook for this, right? Only a dough hook, yeah. yes. So. And it's the reason why we're making, we're making what is one kilo of dough. So what that means is five, we're gonna get five pizzas from this dough, okay? So you might be thinking, but I only want one. If you only want one dough, it's very hard to mix in a mixer for a tiny amount of dough. Mm -hmm. So what I would say is with pizza dough, you can always make more and you can freeze whatever you don't use, or you can even bake them and reheat the pizzas later. So it, it makes more sense for a mixer to make a larger amount of dough, but Got not it. too much either. If we try to make too much dough in this mixer, it won't fit in the mix. Yeah. Okay? Yep. okay, so I'm gonna check the texture now of the dough. And we're feeling like the dough is starting to become a little stronger. And you can see, you can actually see some of what is the gluten that is actually developing. So the little strings that you see in the dough, that is actually gluten formation, okay? so. What we have now is a dough that I would call that it's at low gluten development. That means that it's just starting to develop gluten. And this is the first stage that I'm looking for. I'm looking for it because I want to add my salt now, okay? So I'm gonna turn the mixer on again. And we're gonna sprinkle the salt in. Okay, and the salt is slowly going to incorporate into the dough. And as that happens, we're gonna turn our speed up and just go as high as your mixer can handle, okay? But again, don't step too far away from your mixer. So I know we have some people that actually have the recipe at home, but how much water and flour did you... This is, uh, so basically it's for every 100 grams of flour, I have 66 grams of water. So it's 66% hydration, so that means that there's, uh, it's, it's between, it's what I would call a low hydration dough, as I said earlier, which is, it's a lower amount of water. It mm -hmm. also means that for the folks at home who have trouble handling dough, this is a very easy dough to handle, okay? Right. Uh, the wetter a dough gets, it just becomes harder and harder to mix, mm -hmm. and it gets harder to handle as well. So the stage I'm looking for here is called, in Baker's terms, is called full gluten development. What that means to you is that this is a dough that's become the strongest it possibly can get. It is, the gluten has reached its, its full development, so I'm gonna have a very strong dough. How do I know when I reach that point? There's a couple of things you can do. The first is you can listen to what's happening in the bowl. It makes, the dough makes this slapping sound as it starts to mix on the dough. And I'm starting to hear it now. Mm -hmm. So that's my first clue, is I'm listening to that. 
The second is, well, the machine is starting to struggle, so that's another sound clue. But the ultimate test is what we call a window pane test, and I'm going to show you what that looks like, in which we take a piece of dough and we stretch it, and we should be able to stretch it without it tearing, and we should be able to see light through it. That's why it's called a window pane test. So this still will take about five minutes total once we've added the salt to reach that stage. But it's very important that it actually does reach that stage so that we have a dough that we can roll out, stretch, and not have it tear apart. Uh, we need to make sure that the toppings on top of it are going to sit nicely and not rip through it. So very important that you really mind how you're developing this dough and how it's mixing and that it does reach that stage. So let's check it now, see what it looks like. Always stop the mixer. Okay, so then I'm gonna take a piece of dough. If you don't like handling the dough, you can always like wet your fingers a little bit or add a little bit of oil like on your fingertips. It helps keep it from sticking to your dough. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna gently stretch my dough and I can see it's really getting there. It might be there. And this is how you can see that it's called it almost is there, it's tearing a little bit too easily, so we're gonna go a minute more or so. But you can see how the dough, what it looked like earlier and what it's looking like now, it's really starting to form a really nice network here, okay? Mm -hmm. So don't pull too hard either because the dough, is, it's a fragile thing too, so don't go like, oh, it's not pulling a window. I mean, that's, <laughs> that, that would be a little too much on the dough. So just try to be gentle, you know, but assertive at the same time, and then, you know, we'll see how we're going. So I would say that we're, like a minute out. So we're just gonna mix this here a little bit longer. Sounds like you're talking to our bodybuilders out there. Don't just yeah. rip them. <laughs> you know, often with students, what I would say, I used to teach, and what I would say is be gentle but assertive, meaning like, for example, if, uh, you know, if you've ever changed, like, uh, if you've ever handled a baby, right, you have to be gentle but assertive, meaning your movements have to be sure, you have to not drop the baby, you have to make sure that you're being careful but you're doing what you have to accomplish. And that's the same thing here. It's like, make sure you're doing what you have to accomplish. Be gentle, but assertive at the same time, okay? So what, what speed are you on right now with your Right now, aid? so this has from one to 10, I'm okay. at an eight right now, okay? If, if I go too high, the machine's not gonna be Kick able to out. handle it. No, it actually will stall. And I can actually feel like it's starting to get a little bit warm. Getting warm. So, okay, so it's been about a minute. So now we're gonna check the dough. We, we just take a little piece, and then we're gonna stretch it. Okay, so I think we're there. I think we've reached what is called a full, full gluing development. Okay, so it's, it's a stretchy dough. I can see light through it, mm -hmm. right? Maybe you can see it with, from the camera, but it's something, it's holding yep. uh, what is called a window pane, okay? So at this point, we're done. We're done mixing our dough. And that is the ultimate test for uh, deciding whether it has already reached full gluing development or not. So the next thing we need to do, because this dough has been like hammered in the mixer, is we need to let it rest and we need to let it cool down a bit. So for that, you can do it on your same work table, but for practical purposes here, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna put it on a tray and set it aside. Because this, this gives me more room to do things that I need to do on this table. So we basically take the dough out. Before you take the dough out, make sure you flour the surface you're gonna put it on. You can use the same flour you use to mix the dough or you can use semolina. I like to use semolina because it's a slightly larger grit than regular flour. So what that means is that it helps prevent sticking a lot better than regular flour does. Re regular flour has such small particle size that it tends to absorb water a lot. Or semolina, a little bit bigger, it's more like ball bearings, think of it like that. Uh, and so we use it for many things, including stretching our dough but also for resting on the table. So don't just plop it down like that. What you wanna do is you wanna create a smooth surface with your dough. So I like to like basically tuck it in underneath with my hands to form a smooth ball, okay? And once I have a smooth ball, then now I can rest this dough. I'm gonna rest this dough for 20 minutes covered, okay? Now, uh, part of what I like to do is I like to talk to people about if you can avoid use using plastic wrap, do that because plastic wrap is single use and it's gonna be in a landfill for centuries. So I like to use these compostable plastic bags. Uh, it's a clean bag that we use to line our compostable cans. 
uh, but it's something that we can reuse, and we can reuse and reuse and reuse, and once it's ripped or torn or what have you, it goes right in the compost, and it's, it's not gonna go into a landfill, okay? So we keep it covered like this. You can set a timer for 20 minutes so that you don't forget about it. And in 20 minutes, what we're gonna do is we're gonna divide it, we're gonna cut it into smaller pieces, and we're gonna shape smaller balls. This would make a huge pizza, so we wanna make smaller pizzas that you can bake in your home. That's fantastic. And I love the way, I think it's important for people to understand why you actually roll that into a nice smooth ball as it wraps. Yes, this is gonna allow you to, when you, have, when you come to dividing it, to have something smooth to shape after that, right? If you have a dough that is all misformed and, and it's got all these you know, nooks and crannies and bumps, it's gonna be harder to form a nice smooth dough disc, okay? So while you wait for this, there's a couple things you can do. Uh, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna make ricotta cheese because what we're making is a four cheese pizza. It's one of my favorite pizzas. There's no tomato sauce in here. Uh, and you know we're gonna make ricotta, which is one of the easiest things you will ever see. So uh, with that people said- People get a little afraid about making cheese, so this might be good. Yeah. This might no, be good. Yeah, I mean, it's, we're using an ingredient, it's a special ingredient, it's called citric acid. Yeah. Um, and so, but you can also use lemon juice. Uh, you'd have to use different proportions. You, you need a larger amount. But citric acid is something you could buy at any like vitamin shop or any, you know, of a, nutritional supplements. You could just buy, it's basically, it's, it is like concentrated lemon juice, basically, is what oh, it is. It. There's nothing to worry about. You, you know, citric acid may sound like, you know, something that you don't want to eat, but it's vitamin C. It comes straight from lemons. It's just a purified form of lemon juice, okay? So for that, we're going to just make a little bit of room here. I think you don't actually get that lemon flavor though, right? If you use the no, citric acid? No, but if you wanted to, you could, uh, yeah. because what you could do is before you juice the lemon, you can zest it. And then you can you can fold that zest into the milk when it's getting warm, right. and then you can get that flavor in there. But great. it's a, it's a yeah. very small amount of lemon juice. It's not sufficient to get it to like really uh, infuse its flavor. Okay? So to make it, we're going to take our milk. Okay. So this is regular whole milk. It's whole milk that you can buy anywhere. It's not a special milk, it's, it's nothing. It's just whole milk, and that's very important that it be whole milk. So, so you weren't out this morning? No, I was not out this morning milking the cows. <laughs> so, what we're gonna do is we're gonna get this milk, we need to get it to about 200 degrees Fahrenheit. So, it's easy enough to do, we're just gonna bring it up here. And you just have to keep an eye on it. The biggest thing is to not get it above that temperature. But once we reach that temperature, what we're going to do is we're going to add the citric acid. And it's almost like a magic trick because in your eyes, those curds are going to start to form. Okay. It's basically what it's doing is it's coagulating the protein. Uh, the protein in milk is called casein. Mm -hmm. And when you add an acid to it, it's going to curdle. Okay. So that's why when you see curdled milk, that's what's happening. So I think this is like one of those things with the mixer. If you put milk on the stove, you don't want to walk away. Because oh, no. It, it oh, will. boy. That's, it's definitely something that you need to stick around for because if, you're, uh, if your milk boils over, that's, you're going to have a mess on your hands. Yes, okay? sir. So yep. use a thermometer. I mean, I think that you know, that's, if you have a candy thermometer or if you have a digital, it's even better. Uh, a meat thermometer might work as well. As long as you can read 200 degrees Fahrenheit, that's what, what's, that's all you need, okay? And I would say get a digital. I mean, I've seen the little yes. ones where it's hard to read them sometimes, right? But digital, yes. you know exactly when you're at 200. Hey, Kim, can you keep an eye on this? Okay, so while she does that, I would like to also explain, you know, we have all of our ingredients in our recipe in volume. But I highly, highly recommend that you use a scale because we're also going to provide the recipe in metric. Yep. But a scale is going to give you precision. And it may not matter with ingredients like water and flour, but when you're weighing out salt and yeast, these are very small amounts. And if you measure them in volume, going too high or too low can have an impact. So yes. this is like 20 bucks worth. It's not, I mean, between this and the thermometer, you're going to spend 40 bucks. Right. But you're going to guarantee success. And that's very important. Okay? So... We, for 
me for making this, I, I don't measure volume. I, I provide those measures so that people can do it at home, but I always use the scale. Well, and these two items you're going to use for a bunch of other oh, things sure. in your kitchen. Yeah, it's not just for making pizza. If you're cooking a turkey, you want to know if it's fully cooked. Right. <laughs> uh, if you're making a pie, you know, these things, it, they, it's better to have it in, in, in weight for precision purposes. Yeah. So our milk is almost there. You can do this with other milks too. You can do it with goat's milk if you wanted to. You, I mean, and you can use like fancy, like non-homogenized milk as well, and it, it works as well. I mean, it's as long as it's whole milk, mm -hmm. it's going to work. Okay. Uh, and this is the citric acid. It's little fine crystals. It almost looks like salt. But if you were to taste this, it was. This is what they add to like sour patch candies oh, uh, yeah. and all of those candies. It's like they mix it with sugar, but it's like a small amount to give you that acidity. It's it's just basically concentrated acid. Okay, so, thank you, Kim. So, if we could get the camera to look inside this pot, it happens very quickly. So, it's reached 200 degrees Fahrenheit, and I'm literally just gonna drop this in here. All at once, just All dump at it once, in. All at once, one yep. shot. And, I'm gonna stop whisking so you can see. But the curds have already formed. It's already starting. I can see yeah, that. You can see how it's the the water, the, what is the liquid part of milk, separates even, out. Even on your whisk there. Even on the whisk, you can yep. see it here. Yep. And so we let this sit for a few minutes. Uh, we, we don't need to wait too long. Uh, but you can wait like up to 10 minutes. And then once that time is up, what we have here is we have a uh, cheesecloth. And it has that name for a reason. And it's used for... You know, draining cheese. cheese. It's a very fine mesh uh, cloth that is, is food safe. Um, and then what we do is we're going to basically spoon this out, put it in here, and we can season it after the fact, okay, oh, okay. with salt. You don't have to. You can always sprinkle salt on top of it if you wanted to. But it's also a good idea to, uh, to season it uh, beforehand when it's all together, okay? So um, – don't stir it too much right now. The more you stir it after it's, it's congealed, after it's coagulated, the protein, I'm sorry, uh, the smaller grain you're going to have. So you want it to be like a smooth, creamy ricotta. Yeah. Uh, you know, the more you stir it, the less creamier it's going to be. So, uh, and just be patient. You can, this I would set a timer also, just to make sure that you can come back to it Because you're not time. trying to make cottage cheese, but the, you want a nice, smooth You want a nice, smooth, texture. you yeah. know, ricotta, like something you would put inside a cannoli. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. All right, so... We're going to take a quick break right now, and when we come back, the ricotta is going to be ready, and Chef Wayne has a few words for you. Thank you, Chef Francisco. That was great. Learned a lot about dough and ricotta cheese. We're going to take a short break in the kitchen so you can learn more about Fair Start Youth and Youth Adult Barista Program. One of our key partners that is also well-known for pizza, uh, Mod Pizza. So I'm going to go ahead and let Omar explain it to you. I was homeless, couch surfing, and it made it hard to kind of have stability in my life. I decided to apply for the Fair Start Barista program. And the next day, I believe, I was reached back out to and they said I was accepted. When I started Fair Start, you know, it gave me that punch to like, ooh, I'm gonna make it big and I'm gonna do something greater with my life. When Omar first came in the program, he was a little quiet at first, but then once we got like, really got to know him, he was not quiet at all. He actually showed up with such confidence and such swagger at work that uh, it was just really a joy to work with him. So after the program, it was like a couple of months trying to find out what I was going to do next. And someone from the Fair Start team gave me an opportunity to start an internship for Mod Pizza. I found a lot of fun in this, this new activity, this new thing that was motivating for me. More than that, I felt like I was a part of something bigger yet again. Fair Start's been partnering with Mod for a couple years now students who graduate one of our youth or young adult programs and even our adult programs can be placed into internships directly with MOD employees where they're working side by side and really learning the skills. At the end of that internship program, they are granted an interview. If everything works out, they're going to be a MOD team member. Fly out, fly out.
When I got that job, it was like everything I ever worked for had really paid off, like in the end. Like all those small steps really led towards this big step. I don't know, it was a real life changer, honestly. Hi, how are you? I'm doing fantastic. Good, it's so to see these young people take the skills that, that we teach them and actually bring them to their jobs is something that is so wonderful to be able to experience with that person. These programs have given me a chance to believe, a chance to do something greater with my life and a positive impact that helps not just myself or the people around me or the people I'm working for, but the whole community together. The mod internship, as well as the Fair Start community, gave me that hope. Welcome back. I am so proud to be part of Fair Start. Hats off to our programs team. A big thank you to Mod Pizza for working with us to create pathways out of poverty and homelessness. And congrats to Omar. That is a great story, and we look to follow that success as you move on through your journey. So on to topping sauce and uh, cooking pizza. Chef, back to you. Thank you, Chef Wayne. So our ricotta is ready, and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to spoon it onto this setup I have here. It's simply a bowl with, I have a strainer underneath it, and I have a cheesecloth, and I'm just gonna spoon it out. And I'm gonna use a regular spoon. <clears throat> you know, some of you might think, why don't you use a slotted spoon with holes? The challenge with that is that sometimes the ricotta will go through the holes and you're gonna lose some of it. By using a spoon like this, I'm really just spooning the surface, and you can tilt your spoon a bit, but that's what the cheesecloth is for, to get rid of any excess moisture. You can see how delicious that looks. And it's warm, and you know, if you've never had warm ricotta, you just, here's how, what you should do. You have a piece of sourdough bread, toast it, make ricotta, put it on top, sprinkle a little salt, a little olive oil, a little zest of lemon. It's one of the best treats you'll ever have. So, um, highly recommend it. It didn't take that long to make this. It didn't take a lot of effort. You just need to procure that acid to basically coagulate the casein in the milk, and you're good to go. Sounds like uh, you just created a little appetizer before yeah. <laughs> pizza time. I mean, that's that's what I, I call that a chef snack. It's something that you make in your kitchen. You know, it, it's a quick snack that you can make. Uh, it's it's something that really having warm ricotta is a, it's a whole different experience from having just refrigerated cold ricotta. So... That's it, you just let it drain, and this is ready for all intents and purposes. Uh, if you want to, you can season it now. I like to season it post, you know, like when I'm ready for it so that I don't break it up too much. I like to let it sit like this, and then if I put it on a pizza, you can put some flake salt on top, or anything you put it on, you put it on top, and it's good to go. So we're just gonna put this aside for a second. So basically that was just the cost of some whole milk. And yeah. a little bit of citric acid. That's it. And time. And that's all. That's uh, Okay. So our dough is already, you know, 20 minutes have gone by. And what we're going to do next is we're going to divide it. By this I mean we're going to make it into smaller pieces uh, so that we can make five pizzas here. And this is another reason why you would need a scale. Uh, because if you were to eyeball five equal pizza pieces, you would get five different pizzas, I guarantee you. So by basically taking our piece of dough... I'm going to take some of our semolina, put it on our scale, take the dough, and we use a uh, bench knife, which I'm not sure where the bench knife ended up, uh, but basically what we're going to do is we're going to cut the dough into smaller pieces. It uh, escaped. So anyway, you can use a wheel cutter if you want. So we're going to cut our dough into five pieces. Do we have a yeah, something more appropriate? So this is the this is just a bowl scraper, a bench knife, and we're going to scale 200 pieces. That's actually one of my favorite tools in oh, the it's, kitchen. It's just basically you can use it for everything, even as a little screwdriver if you need to. <laughs> uh, 
uh, tie it in something. I'm not going to do the entire dough because that's going to take a while. But see, here I have exactly 200 grams of dough, and I'm going to do this five times. Now, I'm taking little pieces so I can add up to 200 grams. So what am I going to do? I usually like to put it underneath the dough, and then I weigh the rest of my dough. Got it. So what you're going to do at home is you're going to take your dough. Notice dough always has a smooth side, right? So this is, should be facing up, and then it has the rougher downside, okay? So we're going to form this into a ball. You can also take a little bit of flour, put it in your hands, and there's a couple of ways you can do this. You can do how I did the larger piece of dough, which is to basically tuck it under, right? This is, I think, the, the easiest way. If you do it this way, you have to make sure that you do pinch the bottom shut, okay, so that you form a seal. Otherwise, when you roll your dough out, it's going to have holes in it, okay? So this is going to help ensure that you don't have any holes in it. That's one way to do it. I think that that's the easiest. If you wanted to uh, get a little bit more how they do it in Naples uh, with their Neapolitan pizza dough, it's a little bit, uh, takes a little bit more practice. But once you have your ball of dough, take it, you do the initial tuck in, but then you're going to pass it through your index finger and your thumb because that's going to form a nice tight ball. Okay, so I'm basically shoving it through, right? Okay, yeah. And I'm pushing through. And you can see how that forms a very tight ball, okay? The more practice you have with this, the better. But again, well, I, can, I can see how that would be nice and tight inside super tight. more so than the other one. Super tight. Yeah. And then we're also, you know, pinching the seam shut. Very important, okay? And then there's a third way, which is how a baker would shape a ball of dough. So, you know, you can pick any one of these that works easiest for you. See, if I put too much, then I can take some off. But again, all of these are the same way. So a way a baker would do it is they would flatten the dough. They basically tuck the outside in. And then you take it, and you can basically you drag it towards you. Okay, And I'm cupping my hands. Basically, they're curved. And I'm creating tension by dragging the dough on the surface. If I had too much flour on my table, I wouldn't, it would I was slide saying, around. No, no flour, right? No flour. Yeah. I'm just using this as it is so that I use the traction from the table to create a tight ball of dough. It's not worth all that effort, I think, for a, such a small piece of dough. I would use the first or second method to do it, okay? So here, after this point... But they're going to have five, so try them all. have five. You can try them all, <laughs> see which one suits your best, and then you can repeat a couple that you like. So, yeah. um, so this size is going to fit in your home oven. If you were making it in a pizzeria, you can make larger balls of dough. This is going to give us a 13-inch pizza, which is as big as you can get in your home oven, okay? So that's very important to remember. Now, this dough, what we need to do now is we need to let the yeast do its job, okay? So what the yeast is going to do is it's going to ferment the dough, and what that means is it's going to start eating the sugars that are in the starch in the flour, and basically, that's what fermentation is. The yeast is consuming those sugars that are in starch. It's going to be producing these wonderful flavors that we associate with pizza and bread, right? Um, so we need to let that happen. And what we can do is there's two choices here. One is if you want pizza the same day, this is going, you're going to have to wait a couple hours before you can actually bake your pizza. The great news is that you can do this a day ahead. And in fact, I prefer making the dough a day ahead, and I keep it in the refrigerator overnight. Uh, and then this way the yeast slows down, it takes its time. Uh, I think we get a better browning on our pizzas when we do it like that. The dough is a little bit easier to handle next day. Uh, but it's going to be crucial that you pull your dough out at least one or two hours before you plan to bake it so that it warms up to room temperature, okay? I would never shape this cold out of the refrigerator. Uh, I would let it sit out for an hour or two before we actually roll it out to make our pizza. So this is our another like stage where you can, you know, you can walk away, do something else. You can prepare your ricotta. You can do your toppings. You can do anything else. So now you're just going to take that same covering, same cover. put it over it, and pop it in the fridge and wait till tomorrow. That's it. Yeah. Okay. So, in fact, if I was going to put this in my fridge, I would be a little bit more mindful. As I wouldn't just tent it on top. Why do we cover our dough? It's so that it doesn't get a skin. If it gets a skin, it's imp almost impossible to get rid of. So what I do is I like to put my tray inside the bag. And if you're worried about, you know, the dough touching the plastic bag, you just have to do this quick like motion to get air inside and see how it creates that pocket of air. Yep. So this way my my dough is protected. 
I tuck the top under and I have this like nice dome. It's going to keep my dough from drying out and the bag is serving its purpose. Okay. So at, like I said, at this point, if you're going to bake the same day, an hour and a half to two hours room temperature, 70 degrees Fahrenheit, um, or up to 24 hours in refrigeration, pull it out an hour or two before you need it. So I, I got, I got to do that bag. Trip yeah. Thing. So just to show you again, it's, <laughs> I like that. It's, it's, you have the tray completely in there. And you just take the top and you just do like a quick. And then you, I'm not even tying this because this could be a pain to untie later. So I'm just twisting it. Hey, tricks, really and, well. tricks and tips, man. That's what it's cooking. 90% <laughs> of cooking is that. Um, and then we just tuck it under the weight of the sheet pan, keeps everything in place. And it's good to go in your fridge. The fridge is even drier than room temperature because that's how refrigeration works. It mm -hmm. basically just pulls moisture off of things. Um, and so we want to keep it protected so that the dough is protected as well. Okay. And then you talked about freezing it. So at that point, say I put it in there for a day. Yeah. I'm only going to be able to, there's two of us, I'm going to make two pies. Right. The other three to freeze it. Yeah. You know, it's always better. I've always found that you can freeze the dough, but you only get like a week or two before the yeast before it, completely dies yeah. out. Okay. Um, so it's even, it's better to actually bake them and then freeze them cooked than to freeze them raw because again the yeast is a living thing and anything that is living that's a hostile environment for yeast so we want to make sure that we're, we're keeping it protected. Okay. So uh, we made a dough ahead of time we actually made this dough uh, earlier and that's that's what we're going to do next we're going to show you how to stretch your dough I'm going to show you how to top it and how to bake it and it is there are a few tips here on how to do it uh, in your home oven because that is one of the challenges that most people have is like they want to make pizza like in a restaurant but mm -hmm. the oven is the biggest distinguishing factor so the ones you're going to make are going to be full pizza so if i was just doing the ones to put in the freezer mm -hmm. i would just you'll show us all the stretching thing and it would just go in dry yeah all, you, you would have to dock it i mean I, this is a dough that you have to you know basically dock it with a, a, a either a rolling docker or a fork um, and then you bake it blind. And what I would do is I wouldn't bake it all the way. I would bake it until it's just cooked, but very little color, mm -hmm. so that when I'm ready for it, take it out, put sauce, cheese, go in the oven, and finish it in the oven. Get that, car get the caramelization yeah. and exactly nice. Okay. Okay. So do that. now we have uh, this is our dough, and you can see the difference in size. By the way, you can see here, this is a dough that is it's a it's a very happy, well fermented dough. These are 200 gram balls of dough, and you can see the difference with what they look like prior to this stage, right? So that's pretty dramatic. That's yeah. a huge difference, right? But that's this is all the yeast. It's been happy. It's been consuming sugar. It's been eating. Little does it know that its end is near. Uh, <laughs> but that's what it's doing its job, and that's what we we incorporate into the dough form. Okay. <clears throat> so. Um, I like to work on wood. You can also do it on marble. Marble is really good for pizza, uh, but most people will might have like a either a granite surface or if you have a cutting board, it also works really well. But a couple of tips that I'm going to show you that are going to help you get your pizza like nice and even stretched. Uh, it doesn't have to be a perfect disc. It's not like we don't have to work on this perfection of a disc. Uh, it, it's it's not it doesn't make a better pizza if it's got a, a perfect radius, right? So, but we want to get it round enough. Um, so I'm going to show you how to do that, and I'm going to show you perhaps what is one of the biggest challenges that bakers at home have, which is how to get the pizza from the table to the oven without dropping it, but also into the oven without it making a mess and sliding all over the place. So, uh, let's get our dough stretched out first. So. I have this, this, this cutting board here, and I have a ruler here, and I have a ruler next to me because I want to make sure that I'm getting to about the size that I'm looking for. And I'm looking for 13 inches, okay? If it's a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller, that's fine, but if it gets too big, it's going to be too thin, and there is such a thing as too thin of a thin crust pizza. Uh, but we don't want it too thick either because it's thin crust pizza. So we're going to just get a little bit of flour on our table, some molina. Uh, this is something that you're going to shake off later, so don't worry if you put too much on top at first. It's not a big problem. We have this big brush here that we use, but you can also use like a, like a pastry brush yep. for, for cleaning it up. I'm going to put a little bit of, on top of my dough ball, 
and we're going to go straight here. And you can see that this is like, it's got all of these air bubbles inside. It's basically CO2, it's carbon dioxide, which is what the yeast has produced during fermentation. So we're going to pop those, right? This is a, a really nice dough. I'm initially going to use my fingers, right? So you saw that I flattened it. When I flattened it, I didn't go like this. I'm not playing a piano. I'm going like this very gently with the no, palms of my hand. No, but I see you going after the air bubbles and Yeah, I'm kind of trying to push them around. I'm, yeah. kind of, I'm trying to push them around, and I'm doing this sort of like sawing, like seesaw motion. Uh, so it, it's basically like a gentle flattening of the dough. I'm also, you know, doing it a little bit faster, but if you were doing it slower, I'm basically trying to keep a nice round shape without really worrying too much about, you know, it being a perfect disc, okay? So if I have a ruler near me, I can, I see where 13 inches is, and my goal is to get to about that size. So there's a couple of different rolling pins you can use. This one is, is very user friendly. It's a little bit large, but the ones that have the handles on it, you know, they help you not have to use too much uh, strength. And basically what you're using is your, your, your body weight, okay? So we get a little flour on top, and then I'm gonna go back and forth. And you see how there's a bunch of bubbles on the surface here, and yep. this is the reason why we're gonna have to pop them. Because yep. if we don't pop them, we're gonna have these bubbles that are just getting bigger and bigger in the And that's why you're gonna dock it? Yes. Okay. So I have an oval, as you can see. So then I'm gonna turn this oval around, and I'm gonna go in the other direction. And you can see how that oval is now a round piece of dough. The more I do this, the more the dough relaxes. So, because you can see how it recoils, right? That's, yeah. That is the gluten. That's what gluten is doing. It's basically, it stretches, but it, it wants to pull back itself. So, we turn the dough over. We're gonna do this a couple times. So, while this might seem thin enough, it's not as thin as we want it, okay? So, I'm continuing to be mindful about how big my dough is, but also how round I'm keeping it, okay? You could stretch this dough by hand as well if you wanted to. Uh, the problem with stretching it by hand is that it's not going to be very even. You're always going to have like a thick rim on the outside, which if that's what you're looking for, that's fine. But it's going to be pretty dense because this is a, it's a pretty dense dough that is not meant to have a rim crust. It's not like a New York style pizza. So we're going to go and try to get this as flat as possible. So what we have here is we're at 12 inches, 12 and a half. We're going to go a little bit bigger. And you can go beyond 13, and the reason why I say that is because if you go beyond 13 and the dough pulls in, then you're good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't be shy with the flour, okay? And again, semolina on that, not Semolina on both sides, yes. Yeah. Okay. So, and it's, and it's totally valid to use your hands to stretch it a little bit, get it into shape. Okay, so now we're at 13, a little bit more. Okay, so next what we're going to do is we're going to put our dough aside and I'm going to show you the trick that is going to help many of you successfully transfer your pizza into an oven. So we're going to use parchment paper, it's a sheet of parchment paper, it's a full sheet. I'm going to cut it, I'm going to basically fold this in half. And then in half again. And then again. And then again. And one more for good luck. And I'm trying to make a disc of parchment paper that's going to be just slightly larger than my pizza because I'm going to be putting my dough on this piece of parchment paper. Okay, this is going to help me slide it into the oven. So I'm going to take the dough, watch this, this is an easy way to basically transport your dough. Put it to the side and get this excess flour off. And we're going to put our sheet of parchment paper down. Okay, so then we take our dough put it back on, open it up, 
Voila. Okay. Yeah. So now, now we're ready to sauce, we're ready to cheese, and we're ready to bake. But not before we dock it. So you could get one of these fancy ones, okay? This gets the job done very quickly, but it's a specialized tool that maybe people don't have. And I will tell you that a fork can work just as well. You just need to make sure that you're creating holes in a sort of uh, like uh, similar pattern, if you will. Uh, don't don't give them too much space between it's where almost, you're making it's holes. It's almost unified, it looks like. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and so because this is going to help me get as many, uh, as even a bake as possible. Okay, so now we're going to sauce, and there's you can use a spoon, you can use a uh, rubber spatula if you wanted to. This is a, a cheese, it's called mascarpone, which we're, it's a cheese, but we're going to use it as a sauce. It's spreadable, it's pretty smooth. If you find like yours is a little too stiff, one thing you can do is you can just microwave it for a little bit to soften it, or you can mix it with a little bit of heavy cream. It's just to get this like saucy consistency from it. So. We're not going to put too much on top. We're just going to go around, okay? Because this this has a, a good amount of fat in it. So if we put too much on it, it's just going to like bubble over. So there's a couple of things you can do. You can you know use the back of your spoon, which is is fine, or you can use like a small offset spatula, as I am. Uh, what this is doing is it's going to ensure that I'm going to get a nice thin layer, because again, I'm not looking for a huge amount of uh, sauce on this. I'm just looking for a thin layer. This is a uh, in the realm of what would be a pizza sauce. This is a pretty wet sauce, um, so it's it's. We want to make sure that we're evaporating enough moisture so that it, it becomes saucy on the pizza as it bakes. Okay. You can go all the way out to the rim if you want. I like to live a little bit of of a of a rim crust, mostly because I want to have something to grab the pizza from. Right? Mm -hmm. So yep. if, if the cheese and sauce go all the way out, it gets harder to eat it. So next we're going to put what is called pizza cheese, or uh, some people call it uh, uh, hard skin mozzarella, but it's, it's basically American mozzarella. This is very different from Italian mozzarella, which is the, the fresh mozzarella. It's, it's a very different type of mozzarella, even though it's the original mozzarella. That's like stringier, it's wider, it's, yep. it's, it has yep. a lot yep. of moisture in it. This is the American version that is a lower lower moisture uh, portion, and this cheese is actually going to brown and bubble, and it's going to get nice and crispy. When so you I mean, kind of the the history of pizza never started out super saucy anyway, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, and that's if you if you think of Neapolitan pizza, which is Neapo it's it's the original pizza, uh, it ha it's a very thin layer of sauce. It's, it's a very very thin layer. Of sauce. And we're also going to put Parmigiano on top. You can use a uh, there's a difference between Parmesan and Parmigiano. Okay, Parmigiano Reggiano is, is from Italy, and that's the, the stuff that is, is dried in the big wheels, it stays in the big wheels, 18 months, it's a different flavor. Parmesan is the American version that you get in the little shakers. If you want to use that one, it's fine too, but different flavor, different experience. Um, and then we're going to put a ricotta on top, and we're going to use a spoon, which We can use any spoon, but this is already seasoned. This is a ricotta we made earlier. So you can take some, and you can just put it randomly on top of your pizza. It doesn't need to be, you know, it's not a floral arrangement. But we're looking for symmetry. You typically want to make sure that every slice has more or less the same amount of topping. So putting this on top. If you did not season your ricotta, this would be a good moment to do it. Okay, so now we're going to go into the oven. And so, then again, that's the flake salt you're talking about? You can use flake salt or you can use just table salt, table any salt. salt you have. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, flake salt is a little bit of a different experience. It's crunchier, yeah, which is fine, but it's also yeah. a larger crystal size. So it's, it's, it's <laughs> not uh, like uh, the experience of eating something with crunchy salt is different from flake from small salt Season. because small salt is more evenly distributed. Okay. All right. So next we're going to go into the oven. So you can use a couple different things. We're going to use this. This is a basically a peel, pizza peel. Uh, but you can also use the back of your sheet pan. Okay. So you can, and I would, I would emphasize back of the sheet pan. 
because it's got that flat surface. Slide it off. Or you can use a cookie tray. Okay, those work as well, as long as your pizza fits on it. So this is why the parchment paper works so well, because we can easily just do this, and then we go, go into the oven. So we're going now to our oven. And I want you to see this setup. I have a baking steel here, and we're close to the top of the oven, okay? So I'm gonna bake this for three minutes. And what's your, what's your temperature, Chef, on that? Go as high as your oven can go, okay? So this one goes, the highest it goes is 525 degrees Fahrenheit. But that baking steel that's in there is instrumental at getting a crispy base on our pizza, okay? Because what it's gonna do is it's gonna give us that bottom heat, so it's gonna give us a crispy base, which is what thin crust should be, should have a crispy base. Uh, but I'm also close to the top of the oven because ovens are hottest on top. Uh, it's not like if you were baking a pound cake or a sponge cake at home or a pie where you want to go in the middle of the oven uh, because that's where the, the more even temperature is. You want to go to the top where it's going to be hottest, okay? Um, and so the baking steel, if you have a baking stone, you can use a baking stone as well. That helps. Uh, but a baking steel is far better. It's not just good for pizza. Baking steel is something that can be used for many things. It can be used for searing steaks. It can be used for cooking bacon. It has many purposes beyond pizza. So it's a heavier piece of equipment. It's made, it's metallic. Uh, it's, it's a black, you know, uh, steel. So the idea with that steel is that it's going to basically absorb heat, radiate right into your pizza. So it gets you, the pizza is going to get you, the result is going to be very similar to what you get in a pizzeria um, with having a home oven. Home ovens are notoriously bad at many things. They're supposed to be they, they're supposed to fulfill so many needs that they didn't become good at any one single thing. So these little hacks help to make it better for making pizza, for example. Uh, so I set a timer. I set a timer because this pizza should bake about six minutes. So I set a timer for three minutes so that after three minutes, what I'm going to do is I'm going to spin my pizza around. But one thing you can do while you spin your pizza around is you can actually take the parchment paper off if, you, if you're worried about it burning or something. It could, if you have your broiler on, uh, we want to avoid that from happening. Uh, the parchment paper was just really to help you ease your pizza into your oven. And it's so thin that it's, it's not going to affect how it bakes at the bottom of the pizza. Okay, So it's good to keep an eye on it, you know, check it out and see how it's doing. Um, you want to make sure that the it's not getting too dark on one side or the other. When your timer goes off, you're go, going to want to spin it because ovens, home ovens particularly, bake very unevenly. If you had a convection oven, it's a different story. Convection ovens, pe many people at home have convection ovens, uh, which means you're going to have a fan that is going to be spinning in there. In that case, you don't have to worry tremendously about how uh, many times you spin your pizza. But if you have an oven like this, which is a static oven, you're going to want to spin it uh, every three minutes. I bake it for six to seven minutes, so I like to check it at the first three. Spin it, check it after the last three. It might be ready, it might not. If not, it goes back in for another minute to get it a little bit darker. I like darker colored, darker crusted pizzas. I like them to be crunchier. I don't necessarily like it to be burnt, uh, although some people really like a, like a really dark bake. So this is three minutes. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to take it, and I'm going to basically slide the peel underneath the pizza. See, we're checking it. We're getting a nice color. I'm going to take the parchment paper off, and I'm going to just gently Rotate it 180 degrees, okay? So, three more minutes. Three more minutes, and this should be ready to come out, okay? While our pizza's cooking, let me talk to you about our book here. So, this is our uh, newest book. It's called Modernist Pizza, and we worked on it for four years. It's the follow-up to our Modernist Bread book, which came out in 2017. So, this will be out... Uh, officially for sale on October 5th. Um, four years of research, many different styles of pizza. You know, it was it was the work of many people. Uh, you know, there's 25 of us that work at Martin's Cuisine, but this took a lot of travel, took a lot of contributors. It was a heavily researched book. There's many different styles of pizza here, including our thin crust, Neapolitan, there's New York, there's deep dish, there's, uh, you know, Chicago thin crust. There's every every style that is, is worth being in a book is in, in this book. Roman, which has become uh, you know very popular these days, so it's all here. It's uh, it's it's 1,600 recipes. Um, 
you know, not just of dough, of course, because there's not that many pizzas, but toppings, stuff you could put on top of your pizzas and so forth. So this is something that we can, uh, you know, be super proud of here. And we have recipes that are for, you know, absolute beginners, like this one. Uh, but we also have recipes that are for people who already work in pizzeria. So it's not just for home pizza makers, it's for professionals as well. So there's a little bit, or a lot really, I mean, with three volumes for everybody in this book. And this on top here, this is the, the kitchen manual. So basically, all the recipes that are in the book are also in here. They're in here so that you can easily bring this into the kitchen. If you get tomato sauce, olive oil on it, it's the paper is like plastified, so it, it doesn't stain, so you can wipe it off easily. You don't have to bring your beautiful book into the kitchen. So uh, October 5th is coming out. And then next year, next spring, I believe, the book is coming out in Spanish, Italian, German, and French. So uh, we're getting close on our pizza here, 18 seconds. So I'm going to check it. And I'm, what I'm going to do is, I, I, th I, for me, I would probably go 30 more seconds. Uh, you can see here, we have a nice browning on the outside. The cheese is nice and melted. It's bubbling. So we're going to go in for 30 more seconds. So, Chef, some recipes have like a little brush of olive oil you around can, it. You can do that too. But, you know, for me, this cheese and the mascarpone has enough fat on it that the olive oil is almost like, this might be a little too much. Too much for If it. I was just doing like a tomato pie... That would be super nice on top of it because yeah. you have the tomatoes, olive oil, maybe you put a little, little very thinly sliced garlic in there. Uh, if something that already has, is rich and fatty like this, we're going to, I would hold back on the olive oil, but that's just me personally. All right, so let's bring this out. So we're going to go right back here. Beautiful. Turned wow. out pretty nice. So there's the fourth cheese that is going on top of this, which is blue cheese. Um, the reason why I didn't put this ahead of time is because blue cheese melts, it's like butter. If I put this in ahead of time, if I put it this, this on at the beginning, what's gonna happen is the blue cheese is just gonna melt out. Well, even the ricotta, you can see how it spread it's out. It's spread out a little, out a little bit. bit, yeah. yeah. But it's still like integral in uh, to the pizza. Yeah, yeah in the yeah. spot, as you said. So we put a little bit on top, and our recipe calls for you know specific quantities for the different cheeses, but you could put a little bit more or a little bit less, it's up to you. Um, and then we're gonna put a little bit of oregano on top. It's just the aroma of the oregano, it just, just makes it work really nicely. And this is ready. I mean, for all intents and purposes, you can see we have a nice browning at the bottom of our pizza. You can come closer to the, yeah, there you go. See, really nice browning at the bottom. And this is baked in the home oven. So. Uh, when you cut your pizza, always I always like to stand in front of it, if you want to get even slices, right? Stand in front of it, and you go from point A to point B, right? Go straight. And then if you're doing six or eight slices, it's up to you. Six is harder because, you know, where's your half, so you have to kind of eyeball it. And that's it. That's your four cheese pizza. Very simple, very easy. Make at home. These are just the toppings that we recommend, but you could do sauce and cheese. And, you know, you, you have five balls of dough. There's five different, uh, you know, possibilities for this. So I welcome you to make this pizza at home. Hopefully uh, it's, it's something that you can do. And if you have any questions, make sure to ask, and we'll be able to answer it hopefully as soon as possible. Thank you very much. That is beautiful, Chef. I mean, so glad I um, haven't had dinner yet. <laughs> <laughs> I want to say thank you again, Chef Francisco. Thank you to Modernist Cuisine for having us. It's been absolutely a wonderful show, and I'm looking forward to making 1,600 different <laughs> pies. And then I have a heartfelt thanks for all of you for spending your evening with us tonight you have plenty plenty of places or plenty of things you could have been watching you shared it with us we want to say thank you um at this point i'd like to say take your calendars down i want you to circle a couple of dates um our next guest chef night at home will be december 16th we'll be featuring uh, chef brenda mcgill of hitchcock restaurant and also one of our own from fair start chef natalie evans 
and she has a bakery called Weeby Jammin. Um, and be sure, again, circle that December 16th, same time. Um, also, <clears throat> they will be doing, I think Chef's going to be doing a fermentation and Natalie will be doing a uh, preserving. So please, please come check that out. Uh, and next month, our most popular event of the year, the Fair Start Gala. Uh, this is going to be a free live stream. We went, we decided to go totally virtual, but it's going to give you a great opportunity. It's on Sunday, October 17th at 6 p.m. Pacific time. There's going to be opportunities to bid on exclusive live and silent auction items, a chance to engage with the chef partners, and a chance to donate to Fair Start. Um, I've, I've had a peek at a couple of the auction items. They're pretty cool. Um, Sleepless in Seattle. There's a dinner there. Uh, there's also going to be a 16-person dinner at Cafe Juanita. So, yeah, get on that October 17th, 6 p.m. Uh, for more details, you can find that at fairstart.org. Finally, Fairstart cannot do, we cannot do our work without the support of the entire community. If you can, donate, volunteer, we have volunteer opportunities, and or help just spread the word with your family, your friends, your co-workers about our work. Again, you can learn more about that as well at fairstart.org. Again, thank you, thank you, thank you, and have a good night.